Cool, so I think we are actually ready to go ahead and kick off. Um, first of all, who am I? My name is Josh Skeen. I'm an Android developer and an instructor with Big Nerd Ranch. And this talk is actually about my quest to uh, understand the Kotlin native toolchain. Um, I'm going to be telling you my story about that, and I hope my story helps you understand what the platform is capable of. Um, hopefully, it'll inform you about what the features are and how you can use it. So, as an Android developer, I've been using Kotlin on the JVM primarily. And, you know, Kotlin was a game changer for me. It changed totally how I would ever structure code on the JVM. Um, it caused me to rethink how I would build my Android applications, and it was amazing. So, when I heard about Kotlin native, I was really excited to find out how it worked, but it didn't really make sense um, with my Android consulting work, right? It didn't seem to fit into that workflow. Um, now, fortunately, I have a number of side hobbies, and this is one of them. So if you can look at the screen here, this is, this is what's called a modular synthesizer. And um, it's one of my kind of more time-consuming hobbies, um, also money-consuming. Um, it's an infinite black hole for your wallet, but the irony is it's also worth every cent that you put into it, strangely. Um, so this platform goes super deep, and it's super amazing and super fun. And you can build your own instrument and then play it. So it's kind of like a meta synthesizer is one of the ideas behind it. Um, these little wires that you plug from different components here, they actually t uh, speak a protocol of voltage between each one of these different components. So it uses a control signal to talk from one thing to the next. Now, it's always been a dream of mine to be able to build a component that would actually work or cooperate with a system like this. Um, and so I said, well, you know, that actually would be a nice little side project for me to understand how Kotlin Native works. I think some of the promises that Kotlin Native makes about uh, what I can do with it would allow me to potentially build a Eurorack module that would work with this system. Oh, and, oh, let's hear it. Ominous. <laughs> I think it's close enough to Halloween to say that. Yeah. All right. So anyway, um, crazy platform, amazingly deep. It's also a good metaphor for the Kotlin native platform. Looks simple on the surface, but actually incredibly deep. A lot, a lot behind the scenes that you can actually get access to, get down to that low level. You know, here we're dealing with voltage um, at a low level, right, to create sound waves. Kotlin native, I can actually reach out down to that low level in, uh, in the binary layer of things. And as a JVM developer, by the way, brand new somewhat to the C and C++ space. So thinking that way is brand new for me. And I've been learning that as I go with Kotlin native. I suspect a lot of you also stay predominantly in the JVM space. So this talk will hopefully help you understand some of the interesting things that I've discovered there. Um, so first of all, a quick um, explanation of why Kotlin native for this little side project of mine of trying to build a Eurorack module. Well, for one, Kotlin Native offers the ability to create native binaries for platforms like Mac OS um, or embedded. So Raspberry Pi could be considered an embedded platform, and I can actually generate a binary for that embedded platform using the Kotlin Native toolchain, which is amazing. Um, if I could use the language that I'm already familiar with, right, Kotlin, to create a native binary that would run on embedded, I kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, also, I can write high-performance audio code on the C layer, and the promise in Kotlin Native is that I can actually interact with that C layer, right? So I wouldn't actually have to you know, try to implement stuff that's really better suited for C in the first place in Kotlin Native. So I could use that as well. Um, and I could interface with any of the other native binaries available, and the C ecosystem um, stuff that's been created with it is quite huge. So. Um, that kind of answers the why. Now, Kotlin native, the tool chain, is actually pretty simple up front. There are really two main or central ideas to know about. One is Conan C, and it's the Kotlin native compiler. And that's what actually is responsible for generating a binary for a target system. Um, so like Mac OS, Linux variants, right? Um, Raspberry Pi is technically it's a Linux variant. Um, or even Windows uh, with Ming W. So you can target Windows as well. I haven't done a lot of Windows development, but actually a couple folks in the Kotlin um, native workshop yesterday 
tried that and got it to work. So you can build native binaries for Windows as well. And there, the C interop portion of this is you know, what generates those stubs that I can actually interoperate with um, on the binary level. So quick overview. Now, when I was learning Kotlin native, I actually kind of mirrored my approach when I was learning um, Kotlin from the Java perspective, right? I mean, in a sense, I kind of you know, was held hostage by what I knew about Java already. I'd been doing Java for a long, long time, um, like seven or eight years. Coming to the new language of Kotlin, what was really nice about the tools, I bet some of you did this, was you took Java code and you pasted it in to your .kt file, and you're like, whoa, the IDE just auto-converted it for me. So the first thing that I did was I took a C file, and guess what? I tried to copy and paste it into C Lion, and I said, go ahead and auto-convert it for me, right? Convert pasted C code to Kotlin, please. <laughs> now, unfortunately, this option does not exist yet. However, I actually think we have the technology to do this. Um, I was chatting with the compiler team yesterday, and um, one of them said, well, we're about halfway there. And I said, you know, that makes sense, because the C interop thing actually generates Kotlin code from a C header. And we'll look at that. Um, we're going to dig into what all of that means and take a slower look at all of that stuff. So I suspect they will add that. I'm really hoping they will. Um, Built-in learning tools like that is amazing. So if you can have the IDE tell me what the equivalent Kotlin native code is for C code, I will learn a ton just by you know, the wind of my own sails. I guess that's an expression. All right. So the first thing that I did, though, was I kind of did mirror that approach. And so I did get GCC. And GCC is the GNU C compiler. Um, I took a hello.c file, and I compiled it with GNU. Um, then I took the Conan compiler, so Conan C. This is on my command line here. And I took a hello.kt file and compiled it also. Now, the first thing I noticed with this approach was, whoa. So program.kxe, it's the output from Conan C. Um, and a.out is the output from GCC. And you'll notice the file size, 738k as opposed to 8.2k for Hello World, right? And I was like, whoa, there must be more going on under the hood. <laughs> now, when I was learning Kotlin um, for the JVM, right, what was the other thing that you often would do in order to understand what was going on under the hood? Fire up that bytecode view, right? Very useful tool to understand, hey, what is this thing actually generating for me? What's going on? What warrants that 738k? Um, now, I didn't, unfortunately, have a disassembler built in the C line, but I did go ahead and pull one down. And Hopper is one that's pretty industry standard. A lot of people use this thing. Um, and what it will do is take a, a native binary and give you an assembly view of what that native binary consists of, right? So it's a reverse engineering tool. And so this is a.out. In other words, it's the output from GCC. And you can see not a whole lot going on here, right? There's two functions defined in the assembly. So let's pop over to program.kexe. You can see there's considerably more going on here. And scrolling through this list, now we're not going to like read assembly code a lot in this talk. We are going to look at a couple of examples, though, just to understand what's going on. And you can see, whoa, reams and reams of different procs being defined here. Um, gosh, lots of stuff, including a standard library and a runtime that looks like it's written in C++. It's added to my binary. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. OK, um, by the way, there's the URL. I'll have all of these slides um, tweeted, by the, well, by the way, and you'll also have the resources and everything in the, in the deck. So, um, so yeah, you can go ahead and inspect the assembly, though. It's totally open. You can dig into this and understand what's going on under the hood. And it's actually a great tool for understanding how all this works. Um, there's not a whole lot to be scared of here, even though, at first glance, it looks a little spooky. Um, it's not, actually. They have a pseudocode mode in Hopper that will actually take this assembly and try to map it to C. Um, that's another way I know, by the way, that the tools would exist for this to work with um, C line, right? There should be a disassembler built in that would give me a view of the assembly as I compile the program. Now, it would be tricky because something called incremental compilation would be needed to, to implement first, but I think they're working on that. Anyway, um, let's dive a little bit deeper. And um, there's my horrible pun for the day, because well, I'm going to actually make a couple more horrible ones. But um, the next thing that I actually wrote learning 
Kotlin native was this aquarium for my terminal. And you can see I have a bit of sea life here, right? Because I'm living the sea life now. Oh, another horrible pun. Um, you can see the behavior of the fish. So they're swimming around in the tank. Interesting. What does this have to do with synthesizers? Um, you might be thinking that. I'll show you. Um, so this was the next thing that I built. And what was cool about this was it involved a more complex challenge, right? So I'm not just going to print hello world. I'm now going to actually interoperate with another C library that's on the system. Um, the C library that I use to write the aquarium is called Incurses, and it's a venerable classic. It's been around since the 90s. It's for building GUIs in your terminal, right? Um, my GUI happens to be an aquarium that I want to build. And um, I also want to be able to uh, call POSIX standard functions for reading and writing files. Now, POSIX stands for Portable Operating System interface, I think it is. And it's been devised since the 80s, and it's definitely C stuff. Um, we have access to it, it turns out, from Kotlin Native. And I'll, I'll get into that. Um, also, you can compile an interface with a C library via C interop to our incurses library, and then invoke the functions there. So that's kind of what we're going to do next. Oh yeah, portable operating system interface. Um, and there's no X in there. They just added that to add to the eliteness of the sound of that, I guess, the eliteness of it. Um, cool. <clears throat> so the tool, chains, it, the tool chain in Kotlin Native actually relies on Gradle now. It used to use something called CMake, but the most recent versions of Kotlin Native, they actually allow you to use this Conan plugin. And Conan plugin inter integrates really well with the IDE. Um, in other words, some of the niceties that we're used to with IntelliJ they're going to be available for this C development stack or uh, Kotlin native development stack that interfaces heavily with C native code. Um, so once I add this plugin, I'm next going to define my program. And this build.gradle DSL makes it a lot easier to actually define what Conan C, which is going to be responding to these definitions in Gradle under the hood, um, is going to do. So this is a you know, DSL that we're kind of used to. It does change pretty fre frequently because you know, um, Kotlin native is still heavily under development. There are a lot of pieces changing, but um, this should work with uh, 0.9.2. And you can see here, all I'm saying is I want to target um, the MacBook for the platform to compile for. And I'm going to name the binary that I actually generate using Conan C. Um, Kquarium, right? Seems like a good name for an aquarium written with Kotlin native. Cool. So once I've specified that, right? So there's my target. Um, I can run dot slash Gradle W and see all of the available tasks using the Conan uh, toolchain here in the Kotlin native toolchain. And you can see that it's listing out all of the possible tasks here, just like we're used to with Android development, right? Um, and um, Conan kQuerium here, look, I can build it. Cool. So I don't have to do any make files or anything like that. It's giving me the nice Gradle interface that I'm used to here. Neat. So if I fire that up, it's going to compile for me. The other cool thing is C Lion, as of a pretty recent version, is now totally Gradle aware. So a lot of people don't realize this, but um, C Lion, which is IntelliJ's or uh, JetBrains um, editor, right, um, is actually now Gradle aware. So you can see the Gradle tasks here available. And the other nice thing is we can see all of the external libraries. Cool. So, and look at this list here. Whoa, AppKit, Application Services, Core Image, Core ML. We actually have access to all of the native binary. Uh, APIs on Mac OS here, the platform-specific APIs, here in C Lion, and they're visible from the Kotlin perspective. So this is one of the coolest things, um, being able to look at all those binary functions from the Kotlin perspective, a language that you and I are very comfortable with. But C, whoops, hey, hey -o. Um, but C, less so, right? Who who's considers themselves a ascended C wizard here? Ascended C wizard, really? I want to speak to you after this. Um, so I'm on the path, but I'm not on the mountaintop yet. So, cool. Um, 
very cool. So C, amazing language, but it's, you know, there, it's, an, it's a simple language as well, but very, very powerful. And it's one of the interesting things about the language. It's minimal, but um, my friend said it's like Zen Buddhism, actually. So anyway, I haven't realized what that means yet, but maybe a finger pointing at the moon. Pointer, pointer at the moon. Hmm. Ooh, another horrible pun. Um, okay, well, so here are my Gradle tasks, and I can see the external libraries here. <laughs> and um, you'll notice this is really helpful. I have an IDE integration with all of these Gradle tasks that I want to be able to run. Cool. So, yeah, and like I say, the external libraries listed out here. Very helpful. I can actually inspect these. Now, the Gradle integration here also let me see, oh, I see that they're actually um, bindings between native binaries on the system already generated for me and ready to go from Kotlin native. And these are the Mac OS specific ones. So like if you were on a Linux machine and you're using Kotlin native and CLion there, you'd actually see a list of different native dependencies that are available here. Um, they're going to be tied to actually what the Kotlin native tool chain thinks is a good set of defaults for you. One that's going to be available on all platforms, so Linux, uh, Mac OS, Ming W, which is Windows, is going to be POSIX, right? The po POSIX standard functions. So um, next up, I was interested to go ahead and dig a little bit deeper here. And stdlib is the POSIX standard functions. So I needed those, right? I think. Um, but actually, let me back up for a second. The POSIX standard functions are different than stdlib here, but they are called stdlib in the C world, so it's a little confusing. Um, the POSIX standard functions is in a different package here. This is actually the Kotlin native functions that are available. And guess where these are from? The Kotlin native runtime. So this is actually bundled up and added to my binary. And these are going to be like you know, your collections API that you're used to using. Um, the footprint of this, it turns out, it's actually a little bit different than what I was expecting. So, and what's nice is now CLine actually gives me these .knm files, um, which stands for Kotlin Native Module. And if I open one of these, I can understand exactly what's going on. Now, one thing that I wish they would add is, you know, of course, documentation for each one of these, just like we're used to in IntelliJ, right? When we're using, you know, the JVM and Kotlin. Um, again, another nice pedagogical tool built into the platform. So I'm hoping that they add that soon. I suspect that they will. Um, yeah, so here are my fish, right? Whoops. Yeah, so I've got my fish. I need to load those up for the aquarium. And um, yeah, and how am I going to do that? Where is my java.io file uh, class, right? Hmm. Well, let me look in this interesting .knm thing and see what's going on. Hmm. OK, well, standard library, yeah. Java standard library's got one. Does it have a java.io.file? So it totally doesn't, and it's way more minimal. Um, I think my clicker's miscooperating. Yeah, it's way more minimal than what you're used to from Java development. In other words, we're totally spoiled um, by a Kotlin's binding between the Java standard library and the Kotlin way of interfacing with that. As you know, type aliases between a lot of the things in the Java standard library. Now, we don't have that here in the Kotlin native development tool chain. So it turns out you are actually going to be rolling your own file I.O. Um, with the Kotlin native tool chain. So I said, OK, well, where should I start out with that? Hmm. Um, well, I'm going to need a read file function. Let's go and look at one from C. Because what I'm going to need to do is use the POSIX standard functions to make that happen, right? When you see stdlib here, that means POSIX, right? So that's how I cross those two wires. Standard library, on the other hand, is not POSIX. It's Kotlin's view of standard library stuff. So um, yeah, so here's kind of like a hypothetical version of that function, right? And you can see, OK, well, read a file, right? So f open, right? They're big on the cryptic names for functions in C. Um, I don't want to bash on C, by the way, because I suspect it's an amazing language. I'm still getting further into it. But one of the cool things is um, you can actually make C really nice to use from Kotlin. And that's one of the cool things. You can put a facade on these. Like, I'll show you in a second. So anyway, f open, 
right? Open the file. Then, of course, oh, and look, I totally omitted the buffering code, right? How will we do that? malloc free, remember those? Yeah, yeah, so you're gonna be malloc free, you're gonna memory, memory allocate. Yeah, so I, I left that out here, but you get the gist, right? We're gonna use the POSIX functions here. Now, yeah, so pretty laborious, but you know what? We're gonna build it, so because we need to load up those fish. And um, yeah, so if I look at this POSIX library file, I'm gonna see all of the available functions. Um, fgets is one of them. Look, it corresponds directly with the fgets function from the POSIX standard library on C. Everybody seeing that? So what's interesting, though, is now I do see a couple of additional new types that I'm not used to from my Kotlin development on the JVM here. Um, C values ref, interesting. Uh, C pointer, wow. So we've got class representations of a lot of the C ideas here available from Kotlin Native, and we're gonna dig into that a little bit further. So how would I go about actually interfacing with the standard library, right, which is that set of minimal features that Kotlin Native ships with, like the collections API, and the POSIX standard library? Um, well, you import them in, and provided that I'm on Mac OS, this is just gonna work, because they actually generated what are called C interop bindings for me automatically for the system native binaries. So let's dig into that a little bit further. Um, so remember these from the C file? F open, F gets. Well, they're here again, but I've imported them in from platform.posix, and I'm using the Kotlin bindings. But guess what it's using under the hood? The standard library POSIX uh, F open and F gets functions on the system, right? So that's what's crazy about this. So I'm importing those in. Mac OS, um, it's using F open and F gets on Mac OS at the binary level, but on the other hand, I'm using Kotlin to do that. So um, I'm calling F open, F gets. And now String Builder, on the other hand, is from the Kotlin standard library. This is included, interestingly. So they included String Builder, but they didn't include file. So maybe they'll add that. I'm not sure why they didn't add file to a standard library, but I'm sure there's a really good reason. Um, anyway, so of course, the problem of allocating right memory, right? So here we are in Kotlin. Guess what? C's got this, so Kotlin native is actually going to have this too. Allocating an array, and then once we're done with it, don't forget to call free, or what will happen? Yeah, memory leak, yep. So it's on us to manage the memory, and Right, um, so we're not used to that from our JVM experience predominantly. One of the cool things, though, is they do include a couple of features that help us manage the memory more in an auto-free kind of way. So notice this MimScoped bit here. MimScoped is actually gonna give us a, you know, um, anonymous function here with a inner context that has this alloc array function. So this is implied here, just like run. You know how this is implied in run automatically using the function literal with receiver type feature of Kotlin. Um, and you can see here, hey, alloc array. I didn't call free, but it actually did free the memory for me once this function fell out of scope. So in other words, they actually provide a garbage collector as part of the Kotlin native runtime, which is written in C++. And there is a garbage collector that's part of the platform available. So, but you have to know to use it. So, um, and it doesn't make sense for all the things that you might want to do either, because we have lower level control here. Um, now, this is the trick that I was talking about using to clean up how we interface with C. Okay, so here are a couple of different POSIX functions that we're using. F gets, F read, F, I forgot what the F that was, right? It's like, okay, I guess they're big on the cryptic names, you know, because they're probably trying to save like time loading it on the screen. Um, F stands for fish, by the way, so yeah. But yeah, so I'm loading it, I'm like, what the heck? What the, what the fish? And so, you know what? We could use some extensions on C pointers instead to tidy this up. 
The weird thing about the C style, I've noticed as a newcomer to writing C code, is it's very common to pass pointers around, right? Now, in our reference type world that we live in on the JVM, right, um, we're used to calling functions directly on an instance of something. C doesn't do that, really. So what we're doing here is making it feel like that, though. And guess what? We're just using extensions to do that. So instead, I can just say file pointer.read line. And it looks a lot like what I'm used to. Now, we could go way further with this. Obviously, we could wrap it up in a class. But this is just a starting point with what we might want to do in order to clean this up. So I like the possibilities of making a C API way easier to work with by wrapping it in Kotlin native. Um, and I suspect that's going to be a very common use case with this technology. So um, now that we are sort of rolling here, we're going to get our incurses library, and we are going to compile it, right? So make install, right? So this is our good old-fashioned GCC firing up here. We're going to compile incurses. Now, this is going to compile it for Mac OS, right? Because we're on Mac OS right now. And what's interesting is, you know, our perspective from developing for the JVM you know, the JVM is a sort of a container for us, right? And a compiled jar is more or less a container for all of our dependencies. Um, on the other hand, the container for uh, C dependencies is pretty much the system. Uh, so your system the is the container for C development, it turns out. And if you look at user local lib here, you can see when I compiled that code, it added these things to user local lib. It's just like, here you go. Here's, here's your compiled libraries that you might want to use from Kotlin or not. It depends. So um, once I've added those, I've got two different versions. One is a dynamic version. The other is a static version. And um, these work a little bit differently with something called the linker, right? Um, yeah, so I'm going to have those artifacts generated for me. I'm also going to have this header file generated for me. And the header file, what it does, it's a lot like an interface in Java. If you're used to interfaces in Java, kind of the same sort of thing with a couple of extra weird C quirky details added to it. But the gist is it's an interface. And once we have compiled that binary for our system and we've got the interface, the next thing is to define one of these interop bindings. Right? So this is exactly what the Kotlin native system did for us. They had actually these files. And if you look at the GitHub for Kotlin native, it's all open source. You'll see in the Kotlin native um, directory structure, they have a listing of different def files available for the different target platforms that you're compiling for. So like if I'm targeting Linux, they actually have a bag of these different .def files for that, that platform. If I'm targeting Mac OS, they have a bag of different .def files. You can already imagine the listing, right? It's going to have posix.def. It's going to have you know, um, coco.def. It's going to have all of the system-dependent libraries defined as def files. So once I've got this, um, I can actually go ahead and add a Gradle task. And this Gradle task is going to use the def file, right, which points to the header and the binary that I compiled. And it's going to generate a uh, C interop um, Kotlin file for me. Um, it's actually called a Klib. Um, so I've set it up. And now I have this task in Gradle. Um, and the Klib here that that task generated for me is actually what makes it possible for me to call um, native functions from Kotlin. Once this Klib is generated, um, that is possible now. Now I was like, well, that's kind of mysterious. How does that actually work? Um, so I'll show you here in a second. First thing we did, or I did, was I opened up that .kt file, and I looked. Well, what's in there? Well, I don't see an actual implementation. I do see a couple of weird things here. One is this private external fun k and I bridge. I was like, hmm, k and I Was that J&I? Well, uh, I had a bad experience with J&I. That was weird, the marshalling and the unmarshalling, right? Um, anybody in here ever do J&I? A couple of people? Yeah. A couple of hands go up. So the marshalling, the unmarshalling, you have to worry about that a lot. You don't worry about that in this world. So I think K&I is a little bit of a weird branding problem here. Um, I don't claim to be good at marketing, but I think K&I references J&I for you automatically. It's not quite the same thing. And here's why it's different. So I decompiled the program after I actually added those, and I called one of the functions. And you'll see in the assembly here, they actually 
call off to the dilib using extern in the assembly code. This is different than how JNI does this, right? Um, we're not running on a VM, in other words. It's just making a native call. So um, you can, and you can see here, this is linked dynamically because of how we set up our def file. There's another option, though. So why do I care about that? Why do I care that it's linked dynamically? Well, if I built kQuerium and gave you the binary and you didn't have incurses installed on your system, it would actually blow up, right? It wouldn't work, and it would blow up at runtime. Um, that's what's meant by linking dynamically. So it goes and tries to get the resource and link it, um, and it says, well, I don't have that. Um, there's another option. So with this def file, you can say, I have a static library. Notice the dot .a, that means static. And I want to actually embed this in my program.kexe. So this definition here is actually going to do that for me, and I could actually hand you the binary without any need for you to have these dependencies on your system. That feels a lot more like what we're used to with Java as well, and I suspect there's some other you know, Java developers working on this feature. It makes a lot of sense to embed the .a. So once I've done that, you'll see here the .a is actually included in that klib file. See, so there's the difference between dilib and .a. Cool, so once I understand that, I said, okay, well, I have a reliable way to give everyone in curses, and now I can start making use of it, right? So I've got my um, init scr function, again, cryptic names. They love the cryptic names in the C APIs, it turns out. Um, and uh, let me give it a less cryptic name. So I use my trick with, um, with the extensions to do that um, often. Um, and just clean it up a little bit. So I'm going to use this. Now, interesting, uh, uh, C pointer. Hmm. What's this, what's this deal with the C pointer here? OK, well, I've got some kind of Kotlin native type here to deal with. What's going on? C pointer, window, OK, that looks like a class. All right, well, that kind of makes sense. But somebody told me that C didn't have classes. So what's really going on here? Um, well, oh, and I can actually call dot pointed and get that class, get access to that class. Whoa. All right. So it turns out our Klib that was generated, it actually created class mappings to what are called structs in C. So if you've written structs before, they're kind of like a primordial class um, is one way to talk about it. Um, it's kind of like a variable with multiple attributes as part of it. And it lives in the same memory space. Um, and there are more wizardly things to know about the C side of that as well that I'm on the quest to understand. Um, but as you can see here, it created a class for me. Not only that, it type aliased it to a friendly name here. That was the variable name that was used to pass it in as an argument um, in a couple of different places. So the C interop tool did all of that work for me, and it made it way nicer to consume this C API. Um, cool. And now. You saw the dot pointed. That gives me access to window. C pointer is actually just the pointer to the memory space as well. So we do have access to that from Kotlin native. Um, yeah. So now that that's all wired up, I'm going to use my extension functions trick to clean up the API a little bit. And now that I've set that up, I can be a good Kotlin citizen and use you know a dot run, right? So those same features that we're used to in Kotlin are totally available here. Um, works great. So I can say dot run. These are happen to be native C calls, right? These are native calls to a binary that's compiled on my system. But it looks just like normal Kotlin. So feels like we're doing something that we're used to here. Now, next problem is, all right, well, we're building a synth synthesizer after all, right? Let's not forget about that. Um, so how are we going to do that? Um, well, that was the next challenge that I took on. And I said, you know what, I've got two options here. I could try to hack that out in Kotlin, or I could use C as a tool to actually do the audio um, digital signal processing itself. That would be possibly a better way to go. And I weighed both options. Um, the reason, so I, I wound up writing this in C. And the reason that I did that was because, A, it actually required far less code to use a type-free system, which is sort of what, what C is, to pull that off. Um, and the other reason was there are actually copious numbers of examples of doing DSP code with C. So there's a way more vast ecosystem about that. Now, if I had the translate C code to Kotlin code feature, 
maybe I could have weighed that a little bit differently. But this was the easiest path for me to go, actually. So I wound up writing my own C synth lib. And this lib has a struct, right? It's going to take in a couple of different attributes that we want to keep track of. Um, the heart of the C synth lib here is this sine wave generator. And you can see here, this is um, generating for me a sine wave. Now, this algorithm, we won't spend a whole lot of time worrying about this, but um, this is actually creating values of negative 1 to positive 1 um, float values. And this is actually called uh, PCM data. And it goes, it's a digital representation of audio info. And it's like telling, literally telling the speaker, how much should you modulate yourself? So a sine wave is going to go with a sine, right? Makes sense. All right, well, we got one of those, and we're good to go. So we're going to literally populate an array of negative 1 to positive 1 values. And this is going to generate a sign for us. Um, now, um, moving forward, we are going to also make use of another library. So this library has a dependency, which is how do I talk to the speaker? How do I do the input and output of the speaker, right? Well, it's in the world of C. I don't really have a, hey, speaker.play stuff, right? <laughs> I'm going to need another library. Not only that, my end goal is to compile something for Raspberry Pi, right? Let's not forget about that. So if I use the Mac OS APIs to do that, well, I'm going to be out of luck when it comes time to actually compile this for Raspberry Pi. So I wound up using a library called Port Audio that actually handles the problem of platform independence. And I can compile this binary for my multiple targets. Right, so compile it for Mac OS, compile it for Raspberry Pi, and it's actually going to work on all of those platforms with the same interface here in my library. OK, I realize that's a mouthful. Um, but I'm recounting my story for you, because I think it, this kind of traces out what's happening. And this audio callback function finally um, does play the stream. Don't worry about that code blind. The code is actually going to be in a repository as well, so I do have the code for all of this. Um, and I'll, I'll let you take a look at that. The, the URL will be at the end here. So um, last thing, we're going to create a header file. This header file, guess what? The C interop tool is going to look at the header file, and it's going to generate the signatures of what we want to do. So table size is going to define the pitch of the sine wave that I want to create. And millis is going to be how long the sine wave actually plays for. Cool. Um, now, here's a def file, right? So I'm going to create a def file. This is going to map to the binary that I compiled, right? So I compiled my csynth lib. And this is going to allow me to generate a binding for it. Oh, last thing. Um, notice linker ops minus L port audio. So if I have dependencies that my C library depends on, even though I'm in the land of Kotlin, I am going to have to link against those. And, um, Getting the linker and compiler options right, honestly, is a bit of an art form. Um, if you've lived in the C space for a little while, you'll know that that's true. I see some knowing nods in here. Yeah. So there is more depth to this, but this does get us started. So once I've defined that uh, def file, I've got access to it. And what's cool is now, back in my aquarium, I can actually use the fish themselves as an instrument. So. I've got an octopus in my aquarium, right? What does an octopus sound like? Probably like something like that. Yeah. So I'm gonna use <laughs> so I'm gonna use libccf to play a sound whenever the octopus collides with another fish, right? And um, yeah, I mean, let's turn. Let's go ahead and run with the modular approach to things, right? We'll build our own instrument and. Why not turn our aquarium into an instrument? I mean, we have the opportunity to do so. So um, last thing before we see how the aquarium sounds is um, we are going to need to ta target Raspberry Pi. How do we get that working? Now, one thing is I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. Um, the deal is Mac OS doesn't handle what's called cross-compilation yet for Raspberry Pi. So if I want to cross-compile, I do have the option to compile for iOS and Android, and you can see here, I'm on my Mac machine here, and I asked the Conan C compiler for the list of supported targets. Um, and unfortunately, Raspberry Pi is not on this list, right, Linux? Um, I think they are working on that, and I believe that soon Raspberry Pi and Linux targets will be supported on Mac OS. Currently, it's not. How did I solve it? Well, I used uh, Docker to do so. 
And if you look at the Kotlin native repository, they actually have a Docker image on there that gets you started with handling the problem of this. So if you spin up a Docker image, you're then going to have a target for Raspberry Pi. They give them these cute alias names. So Raspberry Pi is actually ARM32 HFP. Um, by the way, I care about that because I'm going to need GCC HFP right, to compile um, for Raspberry Pi for all the dependencies as well. So this is going to generate my program.kxe for Raspberry Pi um, just fine. That's going to compile just fine. What I learned through this process is that's easy. That's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is getting the C part of that to compile correctly for the Raspberry Pi target. right? And so I'm actually going to have a blog post that talks about how I got all of that to work soon, because um, it goes way out of scope of this talk. But it's, it was more elaborate to get those things to compile correctly for Raspberry Pi. Right? So my dependencies are what? In curses, right? port audio, right? and also what was the other one? The library that I wrote, it's uh, CSynth. So all of those are dependencies. Now, oh, and I also brought in a, um, a WAV file player as well, a C library that's platform dependent. So now that I've accomplished all of that, this is more complicated. I'm going to release a blog post about this soon. Um, let's see what we finally got here. So notice that dude with the pitchfork. Just, just watch. Let's see. What would that guy sound like? Right? Just watch. <laughs> so you didn't know that an aquarium could be a musical instrument. You're finding that out today. That's the C demon right there. Yeah. <laughs> feel that? You feel the bass from the bass? Or the bass from the bass? Yeah, sorry. All right, the last horrible pun. OK, sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like I was just saying, let, I mean, to, what would be the next step, right? I mean, so here's my modular rig. How do I actually get it to talk to this? So this is actually what I'm working on right now. And we have technically something that could live in the Euro rack. Um, but what it doesn't do yet is accept control voltages in or send control voltages. Um, what's so these get abstract pretty quickly, by the way. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I've got this terminal tedium project, and it's a hardware and a software project. It's amazing, and it has C libraries that come with it. You can actually bind to those C libraries from Kotlin. That's what I'm working on right now. And it's a, a bit of a sh it's kind of like a shield for your Raspberry Pi. Um, the work, the legwork of actually making an API that allows you to accept control voltages and send control voltages is done for you pretty much. Um, the binding between the C libraries is um, all set up and ready to go. I just have the hardware itself to actually work on. So um, this is the URL to the project. I've got it in the list of resources. It's amazing, and it should give me the legs to actually accept control voltages, voltages to perhaps control the speed of the fish um, or you know, other variables that might be interesting to work with in the aquarium. So thinking about those as well. Um, quick list of takeaways and recap before we wrap up. Kotlin Native, it totally opens the door to the C layer of things, the C side of things. It's also a bit of a gateway to actually learning more about the C programming language, which I've been isolated from, but now it turns out I really want to learn more about it. Um, and it's got a minimal standard library like you saw, but it does allow you to build, of course, the features of the standard library. You just have to be up, actually up for the task using POSIX. Um, my, list, my little K&N uh, li wish list here, uh, Kotlin native uh, wish list, better cross-compilation support would be one thing that I'd love to see. 
So I'd love to be able to compile for Raspberry Pi without spinning up a Docker image, in other words. Um, incremental compilation, so the build time does take a while on Kotlin Native. You sit there for a good amount of time per build, whereas GCC, I mean, it just flies, right? So you have to wait. Um, and they are working on that, from what I hear, so I'd love that, like, soon. And then including docs in the API would be really amazing, right? Because I could actually read how these things work in the API. Um, it would be a living kind of document. Um, and a built-in disassembler would be extremely helpful for understanding what's going on, right? So I'd love to be able to do the same thing that I did with IntelliJ, learning how Java works um, and co how Kotlin translates to Java bytecode. Um, and finally, I'd love a convert C uh, to Kotlin native uh, feature as well. That would be amazing for learning here. So, um, so anyway, here's a list of the resources. I will link to the slide deck on Twitter soon. And, um, so I just wanted to say um, you're a great crowd, and um, so thank you so much. I hope this talk helped you, and um, thanks for being here.